Well, we said that we're going to have an important study concerning the principles of faith this morning. Oh, hallelujah. And it will only be the first in uh, this series of studies that we're going to do in this area. We began this larger, broader series last summer, I believe, in looking at the principles of faith and the faith message. And we all, I think, in our Christian life see more and more how important faith is, not just in receiving things from God, but in standing in a right relationship before him. That if we entertain doubt or fear or unbelief, well, of any sin, unforgiveness, you know, why, why is it that we would hold unforgiveness? Well, oh, fear of our own reputation, fear that if we forgave someone, then such and such, or pride or whatever. Faith is important for our right standing before God. Without faith, we know that we cannot please him. Amen. And we are concentrating in this series, and we don't make any apology that we are because it's in the word of God. We're concentrating on receiving things from God's promises. We're concentrating on things like divine healing and prosperity, but it would include other things that God has promised us, such as peace in our mind or right relationships with other people. God has promised that, even peace before our enemies. On many occasions, anyway, we know that the church in Jerusalem had favor with God and with man, and Jesus had favor with God and with man. There are ways and times in which and during which that's certainly possible. And so the first principle that we gave you concerned God's will, and I said that God is willing to, well, without going through that sentence, I could say this, God's willing to do what he said that he's willing to do. Amen. You know, what it comes down to is we've got to get into the Word. A lot of people need to get into the Word and find out what God's will is because that's a revelation of His will. They tell us that God won't heal us, but God's willing to do whatever He said that He's willing to do. That's why we don't pray, God, if you're willing, then do it. Because we ought to know from reading the Word of God whether or not He's willing. And if we know that, then we don't have to preface our prayers with an if then. If we preface our prayers with an if, we simply are manifesting the fact we don't know whether or not it is God's will. And we better know. We better know. Amen. John tells us in 1 John 5, 14 and 15 how important it is that if it's not God's will, he won't answer our prayers. Right. Above that, he won't even be listening to us. Amen. We only have confidence in God, and he tells us about that confidence that we have if we know that we're praying according to his will. Hallelujah. And you know a lot of people preface their prayers with if. God, if, if it's your will, Father, Heavenly Father, Lord, Jesus, whatever, if it's your will, do this. Well, wouldn't that sound ridiculous saying to take that over into the model prayer in Matthew 6? Now, our Father who art in heaven, uh, let thy will be done on earth, if it be thy will. <laughs> or let thy kingdom come, if it be thy will. Well, we would never pray that. Why? Well, we know what his will is because he just said, pray, thy kingdom come. So we say, thy kingdom come. We don't say, if it be thy will, let thy kingdom come. If it be thy will, let thy will be done. Amen. Wouldn't that be foolish? Well, that's what we're praying. We, Christendom, whenever we say now, heal me if it be thy will. We're saying, if it be thy will, do what thy will is. You see, if we know what God's will is, we won't be saying, if it be thy will. We'll say, do your will. This is your will. Do it. Do it in my life. Let your kingdom come. We know it's his will for the kingdom of God to come on the earth. So we don't think about that and say, now, I'm not for sure if it is or not. I don't know if it's God's will for his kingdom to come or the devil's to come or no one's to come. So, Father, if it be thy will. We don't pray that way. And yet we find ourselves, the church, in the ridiculous, ludicrous position. And we have to laugh at it. To pray that type of prayer, if it be thy will, about things that are clearly revealed in God's word to be thy will. So we're saying, Father, if it be thy will, do what you have said is your will. And so there's where most people stumble right there. They simply do not believe in divine healing. They do not believe in prosperity. They do not believe it's God's will. They say that they don't believe it anyway. And so they don't receive. If they don't stumble there. The devil's going to catch them on the second principle. And I don't know that we're going to spend a year here like we did on the first one, but we're going to spend some time because it's equally important. It really is. We know it's very important to know what God's will is, so we're praying inside his will and according to his will and not outside of it. But the second principle uh, that I would like to give you, I will give you as a question. I will give you as a question. 
we first of all said that God's will is divine healing, prosperity, and deliverance from demon spirits. And the second principle in this big, broad series, which we're going to begin on this morning, is are you willing? Are you willing? Amen. Now, I want to show you, we'll just begin this deep, profound study this morning, but I just I want to show you here to begin with how important this second principle is, one that you don't maybe think a lot about, and I hope you will from here on out, and one that other people certainly don't have a lot to say about, or maybe they don't know very much of. Are you willing? Are you willing? We thought we had it all down to find out what God's will is, and as soon as we find out what God's will is, we just said, all right, thy will be done. Well, no, not exactly. The Bible has a lot more to say. In addition to that, that's important. That's a stepping stone. That's the first one. That's the first link in the chain. Wouldn't it be ludicrous for us to be willing if God's not willing? Well, then we're never going to get anything. We can just be willing and willing and willing. And if God's not willing, we're not going to receive. So the first thing is, is God willing to do what he said that he's willing to do in his work? Well, we found out, yes, he is. And what that takes is a little study of the Bible. Now, another thing that's going to take a little study of the Bible is this question of our own will. Are we willing? So I've entitled this study, which is just going to introduce us to this broad field, our will, or you could say the human will or the Christian's will, as it relates to receiving from God. Our will as it relates to receiving from God. Now, I don't know where all of you are out there this morning, but various thoughts can, can begin swimming through your mind. What does he mean, our will? Well, I know what, how some people would take that, and we've got various groups and camps of people who would probably mistake make a mistake, they would mistake what I've just said, our will or the Christian's will or the human will as it relates to receiving from God. But what we're going to do through the word is show you how important this second principle is, your will, your will. We could say willingness, but we mean willingness in a little stronger fashion than the dictionary would probably define it. But we could say that your willingness in the whole matter. A lot of people will pipe up in a hurry and say, I'm willing. I praise God that I found out that God's willing. I know I was willing all along. I was willing when I was lost to get healed. So, and I had to go the doctor route and never did get healed. So it's good news to me to find out that God is willing because I've been willing all along. I don't know about that, according to what the Word teaches. The Word has some rather profound things. Do you realize, friends, that we have whole churches which are built on a Pentecostal history, like the name of the church might be Divine Healing Tabernacle. And it is so often as filled with sick and needy people as any other church. Or you might have Prosperity Cathedral. And there are as many poor people there as you'll find elsewhere. You see, these people have become convinced that God's will is divine healing, that God's will is prosperity. They've become convinced of that, and they could argue a good case for that. But they've never settled the question whether or not they're willing to receive from God. How else can you explain the fact that these people believe that it's true, and yet they don't experience it in their own life? I'm always a little amused when I get in the mail and I order from one of my places I buy books from, when I get in the mail a book on divine healing written by an old stalwart of the Pentecostal faith, and you'll see his picture on the back, humpback, deformed, crippled, probably just had a double or triple bypass, big old Coke bottle thick glasses on, and man, he'll just argue for divine healing from Exodus 15, 26 to 1 Peter 2, 24. And it's all, I always find that a little humorous, and he he can persuade you because he's teaching right out of the Word of God that healing is in the Word, that it's in the atonement, that it's the will of God. There are any number of Pentecostal pioneers out there who have a doctrine of divine healing, who have a doctrine of divine healing, but who don't experience divine healing in their own life. Amen. That must be a snare that the devil gets people in. He'll allow them to see the truth of the Word of God as long as they never experience it. Oh, he'd rather them not see the truth of the word, but if through seeing the truth of the word, maybe they can become hardened to it and never really receive anything, well, he's won the same way. That's right. 
You know, the devil did try to prohibit Jesus from even being on the scene. You know, Herod and Bethlehem and the murder of the children under the age of two in Matthew chapter two. He wasn't successful there. And so what happened? He just made sure that the hearts of the people were hardened. And they had Jesus there in their midst. They had a real experience with him. He walked right by them, many Jews throughout Israel. And yet they never received from him, though. He was there, but they never received. Amen, brother. They never received. And I think the same thing is true in the church today. What, what else can we say about these people? I'm always amused. I've got several books like that. Of, they'll call him an old stalwart in the Pentecostal faith. And yet he's sick, he's crippled, he's poor, he's depressed, he has a broken marriage. All or some of the above mentioned. And yet he can argue right from the word, just like you would argue or I would argue, because he's got the word. He's got the word. He knows what the word teaches. And you open the book, and there's a chapter on healing, and, and, and healing doesn't come from doctors, and healing's from God, and healing's in the atonement, healing in the Old Testament, and healing in Jesus' ministry, and healing in the apostles' ministry, and healing through church history, and healing in the 20th century. And you just read page after page. Wow, it all sounds so good. Then you turn over to the back of the book and see double bypass, Coke bottle, thick glasses, Pentecostal preacher on the back. People have these things for doctrines. There are various Pentecostal schools where everybody wears glasses, or at least half the people, and they either go to the doctor, they don't go to the doctor, but go to God, but don't get healed by God. Many people have tried. Some of us were talking about a woman the other night here after a service who tried to receive her healing after she'd gone the medical route for a number of years, and it was a live or die situation, and she died. She refused medical treatment. I'm going to trust God here, and she died. And all oh, that really gives a bad name to the faith healing movement, doesn't it? When there's someone foregoes medical treatment, and they die. And this wasn't one of these lunatic, glory barn, faith assembly type people, you know, like ourselves. This was a mainline, charismatic, denominational female personality out there. They had seen enough from the word and been in enough charismatic circles to say, you know what, if we're, gonna, if we're going to pretend like we're charismatics, then let's pretend like we are. Charismatics don't go to doctors. Amen. They go to the elders of the church. They go Amen. to the atonement. They go to the cross. So if we're going to pretend like we're charismatics, let's go ahead and pretend like that. And she pretended and died, and her dying wasn't a pretense. It was real. Uh, I hope she went to be with the Lord. I assume that she did. She had some other problems in her life, but if she trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior, then she's in heaven now, and she found out her mistake. Her mistake was she had a doctrine, but she wasn't willing, though. God said, if you're willing, it's going to happen. Amen. If you're willing. He said, what things soever you desire, you have a will for, right. you're going to receive. Amen. Whatever you desire I'll must be a key, that. then, in desire. We'll get into that passage, Mark eleven twenty four. 24. The Greek doesn't really say desire. It's talking about prayer there. But why would you be praying unless you had a desire for something? But the, only the type of prayer where you really have your will involved is a Mark eleven twenty four 24 prayer when you're going to receive anything. And whether you like or don't like desire there, it's in the Bible. It's in Psalm 37, 4. God will give you the desires of your heart. And what we're desiring for, we're praying about. But sometimes what people are praying about, they're not desiring. One way of saying that's true. What we're desiring, we're praying about. But what people are praying about, they're not necessarily desiring. And if they don't desire, they're not going to receive. So our will as it relates to receiving from God. What we're going to see, not this morning, later on, but we're going to look at, probably just do some studies from individual passages in the Gospels where, well, like I'm sure we're going to be looking at the woman with the issue of blood at her radical behavior, she had a desire. She had a will for something. There were many people around Jesus who I'm sure needed healing. There were many sick people around Jesus. One woman pressed through the crowd, pressed through the multitude, Amen. and touched the hem of his garment. And she received. Amen. There were many sick people. There were many sick Jews. There were many sick children of religious Jewish leaders. But one man and one man only, Jairus by name, a ruler of the synagogue, had a daughter who was sick unto death. And he came and said, Lord, come and lay your hands on her. I know that she'll be well. He had a real desire. I'm sure all the other fathers desired their sick daughters to be whole also. But they didn't desire it in the scriptural way. 
They didn't want it as he wanted it. Only the people who wanted it. There were many demon-possessed people, but there was one Canaanite woman who said, I must have my answer. I must have it, and I must have it now. Amen. And Jesus said, then it's yes to you. Praise it's yes God. to you. The Bible has a lot to say about our desire. And we play around with these things and say, oh, I heard that that's the will of God, so everybody else is believing for it. I think I'll believe for it too. That's not the faith way. That's right. A lot of people get caught up, kind of swept into the currents, yeah. you know, following other people like these Pentecostals, and that's what you'll become 60 years from now. Right. An old, stalwart Pentecostal right. with no healing and no prosperity. But yet you believed it all along. You believed it. I don't question that. They really do believe it. They believe that it's God's will. But that's principle number one, though. There's another principle here. What is your will in the matter? Only those who are willing are going to eat of the good of the land. Only those who are willing. Not those who play around over there in ankle-deep water by the shore who just play around. Only those who want to get out there and swim to wherever the answer is, who are really willing to do something about it. Amen. They're the only ones who are going to receive. So that's what we're talking about concerning our will as it relates to receiving from God. That's what the whole study is going to be about. I've summed it up in a capsule here to begin with. Our will as it relates to receiving from God. It does relate, does it not, to receiving from God? Our will. Yeah, I believe it. It relates to receiving from God. It really does. God can He is willing. We've already proven that. Whether we're willing or not, God's willing to save us, heal us. He's not willing that any perish, but that all come to the knowledge of the That's truth. Right. But that, that, that doesn't mean he's going to save them because that doesn't mean that they're willing to be saved. Amen. He doesn't will for them to perish, though. He's not willing that any perish. Amen. Yet they perish anyway. The fault must be on their side, not on God's side. God wasn't willing for Adam to do what he did. God's plan for Adam was to obey me, and he didn't. That's Adam's fault. Oh, God can still work things out, but that's not God's fault. That's Adam's fault. God didn't cause the fall. God permitted the fall. The fall, what is the fall? But it's an act of the rebellion of Adam and Eve's spirit. That's what the fall is. God didn't cause the fall. That's not a fall. That's throwing somebody down the stairs. God didn't throw anybody down the stairs in the garden. Adam fell. Eve fell through what? Through rebellion of their will against the will of God. God's will was eat of the tree of life, eat of any of the other trees in the garden, and you'll live forever as long as you don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was God's will, and he expressed what his will was. And if they would have just said, all right, we're willing because God's willing and we're, will, we're willing to do what God wants us to do, what he wills for us to do. Amen. They would have experienced just what God said. No death, no sickness, no plague, no curse, no adversity. Oh. They would have lived forever. And yet they chose to rebel in their will and their spirit against the will of God. So it wasn't a case of God throwing someone down the stairs. It was called the fall in theology, not the being thrown down. The fall, they fell. God didn't push them over. They fell. And that's exactly where we find ourselves today. Amen. Now, let's take a safeguard here and tell you what we're not talking about. Let's distance ourselves from a group of people out there, the mystically infected Rhema people, especially as it's manifested through the teachings of a certain South Korean megachurch pastor. We're not talking about this possibility thinking, this visualization concept, this dream your way to success, this humanism of these mystically infected people. I read in one of the publications the other day by one of the American ministers who propagate this era, taught by this man over in South Korea, but many people have taught it. It comes out of Eastern mysticism and Eastern religion where you dream your way to success, you think in your mind, and that is divorced too often. I think it's divorced from thinking, believing what the Word says and receiving what the Word of God has to say. We know that the Bible does say in Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. But uh, if you try to divorce that from a Christian life or from a Christian perspective or from a Christian interpretation, you have humanism on your hands then. Well, I can be whatever I want to be. Just think about it. 
I can be whatever I want to be. It says, as a man thinks, so is he. See, if you divorce that from obedience to God and to his word, we have humanism on our hands then. And that's what some of these people have done. Dream your way to success. So I read in the latest publication, this monthly mail out of this uh, minister here in the United States, and he's quoting this South Korean man. When he first met him, this South Korean megachurch pastor told him there's nothing more beautiful than a pregnant man. And he said, I didn't know what he meant, first of all. And then, you know, I got to know him and I found out what he meant by that. Pregnant, that is, with a dream, with a vision. There's nothing more beautiful than a pregnant man, a man who has a vision. And he tells the story of how this South Korean pastor lived, literally, on the rubbish heap. You know, he lived in the town dump. And that's what he was. Now he has a church of about a million people related to it. He lived on the town dump. And he began believing God for a bicycle and a desk, and then he went from a bicycle and a desk and a notepad to this, and then he finally grew up to a million people. And they use a verse over in, if you'll turn over to Proverbs 29, I am sure I've commented on this before, Proverbs 29, 18. Proverbs 29, 18. This is what we're not talking about, our will as it relates to receiving from God, of divorcing these sound biblical truths from their biblical context or from a Christian perspective. I'll say more of what I mean by what I'm saying here in just a moment. But in Proverbs 29, in verse 18, we read, where there's no vision, the people perish. That's where they get a lot of their nonsense from. Proverbs 29, 18, where there's no vision, the people perish. In other words, there's nothing more beautiful than a pregnant person, a pregnant man who has what? A vision. He has conceived a vision in his spirit, they'll talk about. And so if you're a small-time pastor, you're supposed to conceive in your spirit the vision of what your 5,000-seat auditorium is going to look like. And they do it all the time. They don't know what the Bible taught, that Jesus had 12, and one of those was a demon, demon-possessed. He had 12 who followed him. And he said, you're blessed when you're persecuted. And the Bible says over and over, God's not in numbers. There's no restraint with God to save by many or by few. Amen. And he generally saves by the few. Oh, Look at Gideon. Look at all the biblical accounts that we have. So you see that type of attitude, praise God, you know, we ought to all, in, in one sense, wish that we had 5,000 instead of five people. That's only because we've got 5,000 more people who are in this walk and believing this word. But I think it's done for selfish goals, though, for humanistic reasons. And whenever you start, you say, well, how would you know the difference? You probably wouldn't, so you just better stop desiring it. <laughs> just let God work whatever he, his plans are out, out there. How would you know? How would you know whether selfishness is involved? You're a church leader, and you're desiring, oh, I wish we had 5,000 here. Well, you know my will. I don't will to have 5,000. That's not a desire of mine. Because how would you know whether or not that selfishness and humanism and pride and ego and vanity involved? I think it is with a whole lot of people out there. Yeah. They want a big cathedral. And some of these magazines are devoted to these testimonials. Testimonials of these people of how well listen to me and i can i can give you any number of testimonials from these people thinking of one down in texas who started off in little bible school and flew somebody else's plane believing for his own work and now he's got you know a half million people on his mailing list and another one down in texas when he and his wife were in the ministry to begin with they traveled around in a travel trailer and they started a church and had eight people and now they've got about five or ten or fifteen thousand and so other, you know, up-and-coming, newly-rising ministers hear that. Well, that's what we're going to believe for. You know, people perish if they don't have a vision. Because, you know, if you don't have a vision, something you're going after, number-wise, then, you know, you're just not going to have the endurance to see it through to the end. That's how they interpret this verse. Where there's no vision, the people perish. But, you know, that's not what the verse says, though. What the writer of Proverbs is talking about is the Word of God. Amen. The prophets receive prophetic visions or burdens of the Lord. Hallelujah. And if you don't have that word of God, the people perish. Because notice how the verse goes on to talk about the word. He that keepeth the law, he's blessed. That's, right. That's the context. He that keeps the law is blessed. So he that doesn't have the law, he perishes. That's parallelism here. Vision of Proverbs 29, 18a equals law of Proverbs 29, 18b. 
You say, where'd you get that interpretation? Well, <laughs> you can get it right here. I don't know if all the commentaries or some or most or what the percentage of them are out there that would agree with me, but I doubt you're going to find many that would agree with these uh, humanistic, mystically infected, uh, well, too often JDS people. It seems like the same ones who hold the JDS theory hold to some form of this theory as well. Well, that's not completely true because Norman Vincent Peale wasn't a JDS heretic, but he had uh, inklings in this area, more than inklings. He had swallowed hook, line, boat, anchor, everything, I think. As far as humanism and possibility thinking and dream your way to success are concerned. So we're not saying now, if you lack healing, just, you know, just visualize yourself healed and just dream for it and wish for it and... Because there are a whole lot of people that are sick that you could really get into some Eastern yoga exercises in the mind they're desiring that. But their life is not found in a Christian context, though. They don't have all the other things that we have in the Christian walk. If you don't have all the other things, then what you're trying to do is divorce from the Word of God. It's not going to work. Or if it does, you're deceived in that. Someone else has blessed you. Someone from below and not from above. So this is a verse that many of them try to use. And I think that's probably where they get their phrase a pregnant man he's pregnant with a dream or pregnant with a vision and if you don't have a vision you know a goal pastors churches are noted for setting goals you know setting goals and it's all right to set a goal if it's a spiritual goal but it's always a number goal money goal attendance goal it's always that if you want to set a spiritual goal like next year i want to be more faithful to god than this year well that's a good goal to set but if you want to say next year i want to well now wait a minute church leader attendance goal now for the next six months our goal is and then as soon as you reach that goal in 18 months you say well now for the next six months our new goal is and it's just a never-ending game of chasing the rabbit numbers out there just chasing the numbers well that's not what this verse is talking about that's not what we're talking about and talking about how humanistic these people are and can be Look at the clothes that they wear, the cosmetics, the jewelry, the fancy churches, the big cathedrals that they have, the graduation ceremony. It's all humanism. It's all self and ego. And that's one of the things or some of the things that clue me into the fact that I think that they are trying to get a hold of a biblical truth here, but they have it divorced from a biblical context though, because they're not living the humble life. They're not living the despised life. They're not living the persecuted life. Can you believe, friends, that I actually heard one of these ministers say, one of these big, well-known, heavyweight ministers with thousands and thousands of people who follow his charismatic headquarters. I actually heard him say that, you know, he's just teaching that if you just go with God, you won't have any problems, no trials, difficulties, no struggles in life. And yet, you know, when you turn to the Bible, you see that people like Paul had quite a few of those difficulties and struggles. And so, can you believe this weasel, this rascal, got out of that by saying, well, Paul just didn't have enough faith back in those days. That today, God has shown us a better way, and the Apostle Paul was missing God. You see, they were trying to get that prosperity healing message, but they didn't know that along with that, you know, Jesus said something comes along with that in Mark 10, with persecutions. Oh, they don't like that persecution, you know. If you get persecuted and you're in that group, they'll sue you. They'll go to court and sue you. Instead of doing what Jesus said, turn the other cheek. They take your cloak, let them have your coat also. They compel you to go one mile, go another. See what God has blessed us through, through giving this word through Brother Freeman and some of the other ministers, is we have a full gospel, a whole counsel of God here. We don't have part of it, this humanistic lollipop side of some of the charismatics out there. And I'll tell you something else that they're known for. They deny the sovereignty of God. And notice how that really plays in well with this emphasis on our will. And we're going to emphasize that because the Bible does. But they emphasize it in a wrong way, divorced from the biblical context. The title of our study is Our Will as it relates to receiving from God. So our will, our will, our will. And they almost reduce God to, as people have accused him of, a heavenly butler because they deny God's sovereignty. Well, if there's one thing we have stressed over and over in this church is the sovereignty of God. And if there's one thing I've clued you into in this church over the years from a historical perspective is that among many good things that Pentecostals are known for, 
all these scriptural things of believing the right things about divine healing and casting out demons and so forth. There's one area that they are sorely lacking in as far as the word of God is concerned, and that's in theology, and that's in theology as it relates to the Arminian Calvinistic question. They're Arminians. They deny the sovereignty of God. And they say it's, you know, whosoever will, whosoever will, whosoever will. They're always putting the emphasis on whosoever will instead of on the fact that God said that he's elected us before the foundation of the world. Not according to our will, but according to his own purpose and grace in Jesus Christ. Now, if you turn over to, uh, what is it, Second Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9, 2 Timothy 1, 9. These people are known for denying the sovereignty of God. Now, I hope you understand what I'm doing. I'm just setting forth this morning what we do not mean. We're distancing ourselves from a certain people here because we're going to emphasize our will, the Christian's will as it relates to receiving from God. They want to distance ourselves from these uh, teachers on little God theology. <laughs> we'll get to that in a moment. 2 Timothy 1.9. Talking about God's sovereignty, he looked down and chose us because we chose him. No, we're clearly told that we loved him because he first loved us. And we're clearly told, that's 1 John 4 and John 15, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. So that kind of puts a pin in the balloon, or really it kind of puts an atom bomb on top of that old whosoever wills, the false interpretation of the whosoever wills theology. Whosoever wills? So that's in John 3, 16. We'll read the rest of John. John 15 said, you've not chosen me. That's right. Now, what are you going to do with that then? You have not chosen me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. And the narratives in the Gospels will show that. For the continuation of this. And the narratives in the Gospels will show that. Did Peter go looking for Jesus, or did Jesus go looking for Peter? Did John and James go find Jesus, or did Jesus find them? Or did you find Jesus, or did Jesus find you? You weren't looking for him, were you? He was looking for you, and he found you. That's what the Bible teaches. Who saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works. Well... Exercising our will is a work of ours. Choosing, making a choice is a work of ours. This is speaking of our election, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling. Anything else is unholy. It's strange fire before God. Arminianism is strange fire being offered up on the right. altar of theology. Not according to our works. And what would be our works? Well, we walked the aisle. We made the decision. We made the choice. It was our plan. It was our will. Whatever's a work of yours. It's not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. I quoted this or alluded to it, paraphrased it a moment ago. According to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus, that's at Ephesians, in Christ. In Christ Jesus before the world began. And by the way, speaking of Ephesians, that's what Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 have to say. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that's not of works, Amen. lest any man should boast. It's not of works. So they deny God's sovereignty. I'll tell you another way that you can recognize and spot these people, you could find them on a Manhattan street corner, is that with their teaching of little gods, their little God theology, their little God theology. They teach that we humans are little gods. Well, <laughs> I know that Jesus said that I have said in your law that ye are gods, John 10, 34. Maybe we ought to turn over there and look at that passage. Uh, but, and that certainly would be a good verse to use with what we're studying here this morning, our will as it relates to receiving from God. I think there are a lot better scriptures because this one could have some other meanings than maybe what people would first take from it. John 10, 34. You see, they're trying to kill him because they want to stone him because he's made himself God. They said in verse 33, for a good work we don't stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, have made yourself God. 
So Jesus is wanting to show them something about their deficient theology. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? Notice his tactic again. He forces them to admit that it is written. Instead of just saying, well, what does the Bible say? Then they could say, well, there are a lot of things said. So he's going to quote what the Bible says, and he's going to say, now, isn't that right? Well, you know, if you're a student of the Old Testament, you can't say, no, that's not right, if you quote right from the Bible. Is it not written, and he quotes Psalm 82, is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? I said, ye are gods. Now, there's a fine line here, a balance that we have to maintain. If we live the deeper life in the Spirit, if we practice the Sermon on the Mount, and I have heard these people, they are on record saying the Sermon on the Mount is not to be practiced today. It is not valid for today. If we live the Mark 10 life where we are promised a hundredfold blessings with persecutions, if we believe that the Apostle Paul wasn't missing God in all his persecutions, but he was living the same life Jesus lived. If Paul missed God, so did Jesus then. Because Paul was simply filling up the sufferings of Christ. If we live the Christian ethical life where we dress appropriately, where we don't put the emphasis on numbers, on costumes and graduation ceremony, anything that ministers to self, that ministers to pride, if we're living the Christian life, in other words, if we've got things in biblical perspective, then there's nothing wrong with John 10 and verse 34. Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods. Wow, that is a profound statement there. Amen. But when you start thinking about that all day long, and then you forget that God is the big God, a capital G, a big tall G. Well, yeah, then pretty soon your small G starts growing bigger and bigger, and what you have is visualization. Dream your way to success. Possibility thinking. Religious charismatic humanism on your hands then. Well, I'm God. I can do anything. I can do anything in the world. You see, the Bible's going to keep that in balance. The same Bible who said, yes, everything's possible for you, said also that you can do all of those things, the impossible, they're made possible. You can do all those things through Jesus Christ who strengthens you. Philippians 4, 13. Wait a minute. That means I've got to have some help. You better believe it. You're a God, small g. Small g, not capital G. And you say, well, that's the way they write it. Little gods, that we're little gods. That's where we get the phrase, little gods, small g. Yeah, but I'm still saying their emphasis is out of sync with the word of God. What is Paul, what does Jesus mean here when he said, I said in the law, ye are gods. Well, go back to what God said were Adam's privileges and rights and prerogatives he was god on the earth he was god over nature he was god in the garden he had authority god said i've given you authority i've given you authority i've given you dominion over all the earth over everything on the earth i've given you dominion over that we know adam lost that through the fall and that's what the second um Adam is all about. He's come to restore that, to restore our dominion Amen. and to restore our rights. Hallelujah. And he came giving Praise some of the God. very same teaching with almost identical words whenever he came to the earth the first time and gave the commission to us, his church. Didn't he tell Adam, you've got dominion over everything? You've got it over the cattle, over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth? I've given you dominion. And then when Jesus came, then he told the church, he doesn't just tell any man out there who wants to dream his way to uh, executive of IBM or something. He told his people this. Amen. I give you authority over all the authority of the enemy. Amen. You'll tread on serpents and scorpions. He came and telling us the same thing he told Adam. If he is the second Adam and he has restored us, and he has, that's what the new birth is all about. Then he's told us that he's given us authority. So that's what Jesus means here when he's quoting the Psalms. It is not, is it not written in your law, I have said that ye are gods. But we can, in the process of getting a biblical view of that, deny the sovereignty of God. See, don't those things really go together neatly for these false teachers out there? You deny God's sovereignty, and then you emphasize John 10, 34. Well, that's out of harmony with the word, then, to deny God's sovereignty and emphasize that. And I think that maybe one 
item that some of these people have never considered is the next verse here in John 10. I find that interesting. Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? If he call them gods unto whom the word of God came. Notice how clearly humans are separated from God. If he call them gods, in other words, we aren't gods by some intrinsic merit or worth. He has to call us that. He has to, as it were, make us gods. God didn't have to make himself God or he doesn't yeah. call himself God. He is God. That's right. We aren't God. We're called that by him. Thank you, Jesus. We aren't righteous or perfect. That's imputed to us. We are called that. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God, and notice now it's a capital G came. We had to get God's word, God's word, and it was God's word that called us God. And the scripture cannot be broken and say of him whom the father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest because I said, I am the son of God. He's just trying to use some Old Testament and some scriptural logic against him. So this is not what we're talking about. We're not talking about the little God's humanism of these people. And you know, others have come along and recognized some of this humanism, some of the denominational people, some of the charismatics who just aren't willing to take an extra step and go a little further with God. And they come along with a huge distaste in their mouth for the idolization of the human will as seen by some of these people we've just been discussing. And they champion God's sovereignty and they champion God's otherness and they say now God is God and we are just but clay. And, and, uh, but they champion all that with their mouth. Because you see, if God's word says that he's given us authority, if God's word says that he has left some things up to us in the sense of our will, if you are willing, you'll eat the good of the land. I've said life and death, blessing and cursing before you, you choose. If God has told us that he has in his own purpose and for his own will given us that type of authority to choose ourselves what we want. If God has said that and we deny that, we aren't any different than these other people who are exalting ourselves above the will of God. Amen. You see, the first ones are taking these passages and misapplying them and the others are denying the passages. And in doing that, you again manifest humanism, your own ego and your own self. Oh, I don't believe God, and they're treating God like he's a heavenly butler, and blah, 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 and on and on and on. But wait a minute. If God said he's given us the right and the power to make our choice according to our will, and you deny that, then you've made yourself God. You said your word is reliable, and the word that we find in God's word, the Bible's not reliable. So at the end of the day, you see, we're right back to humanism. We're right back to the devil working through people to create false ideas that separate them from the clear, pure teaching in the word of God. This is as much revolt against God, even though they would champion God's sovereignty and his transcendence and his otherness with their mouth. This is as much a revolt against God as the little God's humanism of the Rhema people. And so if you turn now over to John chapter 5, there's a verse in John 5 that I used in a message about a year ago that we're going to kind of say is the theme, text, or passage, but I'm really going to have to go to another one because I want to make it broader than simply what he asks the man here in John 5. John 5 and verse 6. John 5 and verse 6. When Jesus saw him lie, we're going to come back and probably teach on this passage again, but we have a whole message, a tape on this. I think entitled, Are You Willing to Receive God's Best? When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him with full knowledge, and that's what John wants to underscore, Jesus has possesses full knowledge of this sick man's condition. And so with that full knowledge, then he asks him, full knowledge of the fact he's sick, that he's been there many years, and he knows why he's there, for the troubling of the water, when the water was troubled by the angel, they would receive their healing, remember? So with full knowledge of all of that, he asked the most ridiculous question. Do you want to be healed? I mean, isn't that a strange question to ask in a healing line or in a hospital where that's what people are there for so they can get well? And sometimes that's the best question that you can... I think it is the best question that God can ask any of us in our lives. 
Wilt thou be made whole? I believe that there's a real secret here in this passage. Why do you think of all the healings Jesus performed? John gives us this one. There are various insights that God has for us throughout the Gospels with all of these divers recorded healings and exorcisms and teachings of Jesus. We could have just had wholesale the fact Jesus healed all the sick, but he gives us certain cases of healing and he gives us the new testament writers the background what jesus said what the people said where they were what their condition was what their response was all to give us some more faith teaching and healing teaching and you could hardly ask for any be better faith teaching than what you get in john 5 6 will thou be made whole will thou be made whole what a question to ask in a charismatic church. What a question to ask in a Pentecostal revival. What a question to ask in a healing line. What a question to ask at a charismatic healing resort. That's what this was, a healing resort, where you went and hoped that you get healed. I've heard of various charismatic healing resorts where these people, brother and sister Jones, whatever, they own a big ranch or they own a whatever track of land, farm, and they have a barn there and they have teachers and speakers that come in and they bring the incurably ill in and they feed them and house them and keep them there until the word can penetrate and the people get healed. Praise God for that. I'm sure there have been some results in that. And so wouldn't it be interesting if the healing evangelist walked in and then walked up to some of the people and said, what are you here for? You know, all twisted up like this. What are you here for? Is it a new car that you need? Is it your marriage that's a problem? Oh, 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 oh. Trying to get out what they need? What are you here for? What would all of them say? Well, obviously, this is a healing clinic. We're here to get healed. That was just as obvious to Jesus, and that's what John is trying to point out. With full knowledge of the background. It was just as obvious a need the man had as a person in a healing line. And he said, Will thou be made whole? Praise God. Will thou be made whole? All right, let's answer that question. Because we could probably ask it the same way two times and get two different answers. Do you think that all of these people that were here at this pool were willing to be healed? No, some of you are saying no, some of you are saying yes. So. If you said yes when I asked him the next time, say no. And if you said no, say yes. Do you believe that all of these people here were willing to be healed? Well, why were they there? Obviously, they wanted to be, get healed. Yes, they were willing to be healed. And no, they were willing to be healed. You see, you can kind of be yes like, well, I'll take it. I mean, that's what I'm here for. I mean, I heard. I mean, I wanted. I mean, I'm even willing to work my way over to the pool and try to get down in it first. There's some people who could be willing to do all of that and they're still not, in the scriptural sense, willing to be healed. And a verse I'd like to also use that broadens it, although it's still talking about healing, it doesn't use the word healing or whole in the passage. This is Matthew 20 and verse 32. Now, again, the need is healing from blindness. Well, I'll read the passage. I'm sure we'll come back and minister on this some more. Behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them, because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? What will ye that I shall do unto you? What do you want me to do for you? We know they say, they, they ask for the obvious. But you know, sometimes maybe the obvious isn't so obvious. Maybe they are blind, but maybe they don't have faith for healing of their eyes. And what they're wanting is their marriage restored. So maybe you better ask, what is it that you want? You can just take for granted that that person in a wheelchair wants to get up and walk. Maybe they don't want to. That's right. Maybe they want God to bless their husband with a different job so he can be home uh, more often or whatever. And so that's what you need to agree with them for. Maybe they don't want to be healed. But you know what happens whenever we don't follow the biblical patterns here. 
then we have these mass healing campaign campaigns where you've got a whole lot of people out there, wheelchairs, crutches, just go around laying hands on everybody when maybe that's not what they want. That's right. Either it's not what they want, they really don't want to be healed, or that's what they want, but they're not willing. Not willing in the biblical sense. Amen. That will mean not willing to do what the Bible may say that we have to do to get healed, like really release faith or act on it or whatever. Or forgive your brother in your heart. You know, if you've got unforgiveness, Jesus said you can't pray the prayer of faith. Mark 11, 25 and 26. So maybe they're not willing. They're just not willing. We know when we're willing, when we're willing to receive from God. When we're willing, then we receive from God. Matthew 20, 32. What will ye that I shall do unto you? Now notice that phrase, what will ye? Now he didn't say, now here's what I'm willing to do. We know earlier from Matthew 8 and verse 3, he's willing to heal the two men. Or one of them, if that's all that wants to be healed. He's willing to heal one or neither. He's willing, Jesus is willing to do, in other words, whatever they're willing for him to do. He's willing to do whatever they're willing. Notice the emphasis in the title to our study, Our Will as it Relates to Receiving from God. This is right from the Word. Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? How would you have me help you? Now, right away, you see, some of these contrary-minded people come along and say, well, that sounds like you're making Jesus out as though he's serving us. Well, what does the passage say? Jesus offers them his service, his help. He said, what would you like for me to do? How can I help you? They are the ones who've invented the phrase butler, heavenly butler, because it sounds bad, makes us look bad. But that Jesus is willing to serve us is stated throughout the word. What did he do in John 13? But during supper, he set aside the meal. He girded himself. He took a towel and a basin of water, and he served the disciples by washing their feet. He even said, I'm serving you. I'm serving you. And what does God do for us but serve us through his many wonderful, delicious promises? That's right. He serves us through them. That's your terminology out there in the church world to say that we call him or make him a heavenly butler. But yes, he has come to serve us. He has come to help us. He is our helper. He is the Lord, our helper. He is on our side. The Lord is our helper. I'll not fear what man shall do unto me. He's our helper. What will ye that I shall do unto you? That sounds like that. We're making God serve us. He's made himself that way. That's part of the mystery of it all, the beauty of it all. He has come to help us and to serve us. And so we ask you, and he asks myself, what do you want me to do for you? How can I help you today? Amen. What is your will? What are you willing for me to do for you? You see, these denominationally minded people have God so up there, and they have him up there, not really in any true scriptural, biblical worship or deference to God, but through their own pride and unbelief. They don't want to God, have God down here serving us for fear they might be required to trust him or he won't serve them. And since they don't have faith, their unbelief is going to be exposed then. And they certainly don't want that on their hands. And so their response would be something like this. If Jesus came to them, what will ye that I should do, Lord? It would be enough for me. It would suffice if thou wert to share a slice of bread and a cup of water and a corner in heaven. What type of response do you think God would give to a request like that? You might think, well, he would say, all right, then be it unto you. If you want a slice of bread and you want a cup of water, you can have it. You know what I think he would say? You say, that's not on our menu. We don't serve things like that. Amen. They thought they were being real pious and humble. Oh, I don't want to ask for healing or for a new car or a new home. I don't want to ask for anything like that. I want to be real spiritual and pious and humble. I'm just going to ask for a slice of bread and a cup of water. You know what God would tell them? That's not on the menu. Right. You're, you'll have to go down to McDonald's for that, called the Baptist Church for that. We don't serve stuff like that here. Amen. You can either have a new home or health in your body or your marriage restored or your family saved or gold or silver. You can only have those things. Oh, 
Oh, I know what the model prayer says. Give us this day our daily bread. But that's a metaphor for our daily provision, for mundane, carnal things in life. But what does God promise us? God doesn't promise us leftovers and worn out things, a worn out body and a worn out marriage and a worn out home. He doesn't promise us that. Amen. He promises us a great abundance that's in our life. There are not any slices of bread in heaven. That's not on the menu. Wow. Now there's hidden manna. Oh, oh that'll God. just melt in your mouth there. <laughs> there's no bread. There's no wonder bread in heaven. There's no whole wheat bread in heaven. Bread? That's about the most tasteless thing you could ask for, bread and water to go with it. Oh, come on. God's better than that. He's bigger than that. He has a better server than that. He has more in his storehouse than that. He has all of the cattle on a thousand hills and all the gold and the silver in the world. They thought that God was just going to about fall off the throne in gratitude for their humility when they'd ask for a slice of bread and a cup of water. They just thought God was going to fall off the throne in gratitude for such a worthy, humble disciple. And what that worthy, humble disciple is going to get is a kick in the seat of the pants. You get out of here and get back in my word. When you find out what is required of you and what is up here in heaven, then you can come back and start asking. Until then, don't come back. You go somewhere else and ask for your old stale leftover man's crust and bread. You go somewhere else and ask for that. We don't have any of that stuff up here. We don't have corners in heaven. We have thrones and powers, and I have the earth to give you, not a corner somewhere. He said if we're faithful to him, we'll rule over the nations. He didn't say if we're faithful, he'll give us a little place in the attic somewhere where we can play with Charlotte's Web or something. God has promised us the earth, the kingdom, he said, is yours. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now, there's what God's will is in the matter. And these old falsely pious, falsely humble people, they are a stench in God's nostrils. I'm telling you, the whole church world is made up with people like that, accusing you. I mean, they have the audacity because you're believing God for the promises. You're asking for big things, accusing you because of your humanism. And the only humanism that I can smell around here is their humanism. Manifested through their unbelief, their refusal to step out on a limb and trust God. Wanting a slice of bread. Oh, come on, you ought to be hitting the head with a hard loaf of bread for a mentality like that. And a cup of water. And a corner in heaven. That's what the denominationals have taught us. That's not in the Word of God. Do we all agree on that? That's not in the Word of God. He said the earth. The meat will inherit the earth, he said. Not a corner somewhere. Well, what would I want with the earth? I don't know what you would want with it, but I can think of a lot of reasons I would want it. If you don't want it, that's your problem. I want it because that's a promise. It proves that I'm meek, if nothing else. If I get it, it'll prove that I was meek. So if you don't, well, you can fill in the end of that. He said to the apostles, because you've served with me worthily, then in the regeneration, you're going to sit on some thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Amen. And I don't find Peter saying, oh, Lord, I'm so unworthy of that. God's going to rebuke anyone whenever he gives them an offer, and they say, oh, no, no. That's like old Ahaz over there where Isaiah said, ask anything, ask a sign. Ask it in the height above or the depth below. The Lord will give you a sign, ask for one. Ahaz said, oh, I don't want to tempt God. Yeah, that's over old Flubberfoot over there in Isaiah 7. Oh, I don't want to tempt God. Oh, Blubberhead. God said, ask for a sign. Isaiah said, ask. You know, God doesn't tell everyone they can ask for a sign. He told the Pharisees that an adulterous generation seeks after a sign. But on occasions, God invites us to ask for a sign. He told Gideon asked for one, and Gideon asked for a double one. He wanted that fleece wet, and then he wanted it dry. So he asked for a double one. God told Ahaz, ask anything in the height above or the, he or the earth below. And with his old sanctified unbelief, he said, I, I wouldn't want to tempt God. And Isaiah said, bless God, he's going to give you a sign anyway, even if you don't believe. And he gave him verse 14 of Isaiah 7, the prophecy of the Messiah. Emmanuel, the virgin birth. We've got these same people around and say, oh, I, I'm not willing for any of that. And yet, watch this, though. On the other hand, on the other hand, they're working day and night to keep up with the Joneses in the world. 
they have the biggest covetous heart you'll ever find. The same people who say, oh, God, just give me a slice of bread and a cup of water. Own 14 cars and 18 boats, or if they don't, they want to own that many. What a hypocrisy in God's eyes. What hypocrites. They refuse to go God's way and get it God's way. But they want it, though. They want it. They, they're willing, but they're not willing to get it God's way. Amen. Our will as relates to receiving from God, that a title wouldn't apply to them because they don't receive from God. Our will as relates to getting things in life. See, we could have entitled the message that. That's what some of the humanists would. Our will as relates to getting things in life. But hey, see, you've divorced it from a Christian context. So it's our will as it relates to receiving from God. The answer is not in life out there. The answers are in God, in Jesus Christ. And he invites us to come and receive those from him. But we have to receive with his conditions up. And one of the first ones that I keep finding over and over, and I haven't given you hardly any of the passages, but one that I keep finding over and over in the word of God is, are you willing? Now, hear what you're asking for, but is that what you're willing to receive? Anybody can, you know, have a doctrine of divine healing, never see healing in their own life. Why? They're never willing to be healed. And you're going to have to wait until we're through this. That may sound like a contradiction to you. Well, of course they're willing. Anybody who's sick is willing to be healed. That's not necessarily true. And I'll give you later on some reasons why some of them have applied to all of us at one time or another. Why? Even though we said we're willing, we weren't willing to receive from God. We were not willing. And until we're willing, and I don't mean any possibility thinking visualization, but until we're willing in the scriptural sense, we won't receive from God. A lot of people pray what they think is the prayer of faith, and we should call it the prayer of words because... That's all that's uttered is words. No faith is expressed, not spiritually. Faith's invisible, and God doesn't see that in the person's heart. They want something, but they're not willing to get it. That isn't their will to receive it. Jesus said, what will you have me do for you? What will ye that I shall do unto you? What is your will? See, God has to, by his Holy Spirit, as we get into the Word, show us what these principles are. If God doesn't show us, we won't see them. And if we don't see them, we'll never experience them in our life. Amen. And I'm going to show you later on in the other studies through some of these examples, like old Jacob wrestling with the angel. Angel said, let me go. I will not let you go until you bless me. Amen. You cannot go. And that angel was the Lord Jesus Christ. Only those people who have a strong faith who are willing receive from God. Amen. We'll probably look at old Caleb, 85 years of age, and, you know, that's about time to think of retirement. And he was just ready for warfare. He said, now give me this mountain. I don't care if there are giants on it. We'll kill all of them. We'll squash them like termites up there. Give me this mountain. Joshua needed to finish fighting a battle, so he looked at the sun and said, stand still right where you are. Well, I'm sure many men have tried that down through history. <laughs> Maybe some charismatics once they heard Joshua's experience. Never worked, though. Mm -hmm. Joshua says, stand still right where you are. Elijah said, there won't be rain or dew on the earth except according to what I want to happen. Didn't he say that? Yeah. Except according to my will, my word. Whatever I'm willing is going to happen. There was a storm at sea and Jesus was in the boat and he said, stop. Peace be still. And that wind stopped immediately. Now, many people have rebuked the wind, and they got nothing but horse through the process. He said, stop, and it stopped. Only people who have a strong faith who want to receive from God, only people like the woman with the issue of blood who will press through the multitude and grab a hold of Jesus, they're going to get anything. Only those people will. 